Hi, I'm <clears throat> Jonathan Heavenstone. I'm Senior Vice President of Business, De business Development at Upon. <clears throat> Functionally, my role means I oversee business development, sales, and marketing. So essentially, all of the business functions of Adapon. Um, for those of you who know Adapon, you know that we provide a publishing platform to, for delivering content online. Uh, we've been in business for over 20 years. Literatum has been our um, primary product the entire period of that, uh, the, that entire period of time. We've grown to over 400 employees. Uh, we've always maintained a ratio of two-thirds engineers. We're a, really a technology company, very light in sales and marketing, I can attest. And uh, we have almost a dozen um, development and delivery hubs around the world. We have become, Literatum has become the most widely used publishing platform in the industry in terms of the number of publishers and societies who we support, in terms of the amount of content that we host, and in terms of the amount of traffic that uh, takes place on, our, on the sites that we host on our servers. Um, I guess this is the sort of pond that uh, some of my colleagues on the panel have been talking about. The amount of traffic that I'm, that I'm referring to is really not a testament to us or our success. It's about the importance of publishers in delivering value um, in this ecosystem. And I would say you know, the core hallmarks of that are uh, conferring legitimacy on content and then driving influence for that content, uh, not providing typesetting or some of the things that were alluded to earlier. So the success of, of us and the publishers that we support um, notwithstanding, we feel that um, we as a company and we as an industry have fallen behind the needs of researchers. Um, Two key cases in point. First of all, as, as others have mentioned today, we focus only on one single um, artifact of the research process, which is the article, which is delivered as a print replica in an online environment, and not on the research process itself, which is so much richer, and there's so much more to deliver. And second, um, we've developed a discontinuous archipelago, uh, archipelago of publication websites. So there's no sort of unity for the individual researcher trying to go, traverse from one to the next. We, we, they encounter separate logins, separate searches, um, separate alerts coming to them in their email. This is really ineffective. And I think we're feeling that when we see the results in the industry where traffic is moving away from publisher websites and onto aggregations and pirate websites. I was shocked when I saw Philip Carpenter's stats from 2017 uh, at his presentation here at APE. And the, the updated data reflects the exact same trend. You can see that of the top 10 um, scholarly websites, only five of them are operated by publishers. Two thirds of the traffic is on non-publisher hosted websites. Uh, and three of those are pirate sites, the other two being the NIH's um, ANI database, um, PubMed, and the archive preprint server. Now, you might say that the, the, these uh, new players or these intermediaries are fulfilling a reasonable function in terms of providing a continuous discovery and access to content on behalf of researchers because of the ability to do searches on, let's say, PubMed or archive, or the ability to use Google to stitch together all these different separate publisher islands. In fact, um, this approach is ineffective in a way that we don't necessarily realize because it's part of the air that we breathe. We've all been conditioned through Google to think that search is the right way to connect um, information online. In fact, the internet wasn't really born that way and I don't think it's destined to operate that way. Um, you can see in reports from users uh, who interact with PubMed that they're frustrated. They're frustrated by searches that they run that are too narrow, that yield literally no results, or searches that are too broad with limited ability to filter down among the panoply of results that they get. Um, you have also problems with uh, interacting with Google and Google Scholar as a researcher in the sense that Google attends to um, scoop up and present everything, which means that there's non-scholarly and non-authoritative results intermixed with, uh, with the articles that are hosted by publishers. Google Scholar is far from comprehensive. <coughs> Uh, and I think even more importantly than either of those issues, both of them provide links to um, file sharing and pirate sites. Why? Because that's part of Google's business model. They're not in the business of supporting researchers, um, helping publishers provide authoritative information to end users. They're really about driving traffic. They're in the advertising business. 
And so, you know, their interests are never going to align with researchers' businesses or with, with researchers' activities or with uh, the publishers' businesses and goals. What we think is needed is an open environment that wraps around the researcher and provides services, tools, and capabilities that support them every step of the way and make their lives easier. And this is what we're putting a lot of our efforts behind. It doesn't mean that we're, we're moving beyond providing our content hosting platform. Uh, we think that our platform and other platforms in this space are gonna continue to be instrumental. Uh, they're not going away, but they're not enough anymore. So what we foresee and what we're, what we're developing uh, and will be releasing over the course of this year is an environment that incorporates the activities of authoring and collaboration around manuscripts, importing data into those authored manuscripts and being able to put that into publication, being able to easily submit your content that you've authored into preprints or into peer-reviewed publications in one place, um, having automated machine learning driven discovery so that you don't have to do iterative searches everywhere or subscribe to different alerts or saved searches, to have one place that knows what information you absolutely need to maintain awareness in your field and expertise in your field and to give it to you and feed it to you right there where you're working. Uh, the, to be able to do your reading, research, manage your own personal library, manage your references all in that place, and to engage in sharing and promotion with your colleagues so that within the, um, the rights that a publisher grants to you, you have the ability to share content with others and let them find out what you think is interesting to them. So it has a human element to content discovery. So this is the ecosystem that we're developing. Um, this goes beyond um, Adapon in terms of our content hosting platform. It's not intended just for publishers or researchers who have a relationship with us in some other area. It's intended to be open and available to anybody. The enabling technologies are along the right side. They're sort of running across the, the ecosystem. And then we've seeded it with three tools on the left that I'll talk about in a moment. <clears throat> First, Adapon Connect is essentially um, our version of an RA21 compliant um, access and authentication capability. So just like you can log into many publisher websites or sites in the web with a Google ID or a LinkedIn ID, um, Users should, with an Adapon Connect ID will be able to log into many different um, publisher-hosted websites, tools, and services, and we want to make that, in, um, in, not interactive is not the word, but uh, collaborative with other tool owners in the space. So for example, we'd like somebody to be able to, add, to log into our services using a Mendeley ID or a ReadCube ID, and we would want a reciprocal relation with, with, them, with them as well. So there should be seamless access for users across the entire ecosystem, whether it's products that we've developed and are providing or whether they're products that others are developing and providing. We're also implementing a workspace that connects all of these tools in one environment. So there's a representation of each of them and in the back end it interconnects the various services. So that they're not just separate tools that you might engage with, but they actually feed each other and help support the researcher and all of their different um, and all of their different activities. And finally, um, there's gonna be integrations available for third-party tools. Again, anybody who's part of a legitimate publishing ecosystem who respects copyright, we would want to integrate their, um, their access uh, tools or capabilities and also implement their uh, tools into our environment, even if it's competitive with one of the tools that we have, because we really feel like this needs to be an environment that's built for researchers um, and you know, let the best tool win or let, you know, let people benefit from different aspects of the different tools that are available to them. The three products that we are putting into this environment are um, Adapon Author. We're, we actually acquired two companies uh, over the past couple of years. One was Authoria and one is Manuscripts. They're both still in operation, but we're gonna be combining various aspects of their tools and refactoring them and providing them as Adapon Author. It's going to enable uh, the import of data sets and the delivery of data sets. It's going to integrate with CodeOcean, um, enable robust manuscript collaboration, um, and then delivery to uh, preprint environments um, embedded right within the, the, um, the authoring environment, as well as templates for submission to um, peer-reviewed journals. Add upon Discover is based on another acquisition we made. Um, 
It's a machine learning powered discovery tool, much like Flipboard, for those of you who are familiar with it. We think of it as like a Flipboard for science. So as a researcher, you would basically answer a few questions of what your specific domain of interest is, and it will start to feed you um, articles and news, uh, re research articles and news from across the web, coming from Crossref and uh, Microsoft Academic Graph. We're trying to source this from absolutely everywhere and try to provide the most absolutely relevant results to the individual user so they don't have to go searching for it. And we can put that into an attractive interface that highlights and prioritizes the things that are most relevant to you as a, as a user. Um, Discover is also integrated into the, um, the workspace so that you can see your Discover feeds uh, together with the same in the same place where you're managing your collections and shares. Um, and then finally, Submission Desk is a tool to enable researchers to submit to peer-reviewed journals without having to interact with the complexity of the editorial um, systems that they have to deal with today. So it's a front end that's more researcher-centric, but does enable them to submit to peer-reviewed journals. And the content that the publisher wants to put into uh, the peer review process will go into the peer review process without the researcher having to do all the work themselves. Okay. Um, this is in an open environment, so as I said, uh, these tools are meant to integrate with third-party tools. There are no charges to researchers to use any of the, the tools that we're developing, and some of the technology will be open sourced. For example, the um, part of the manuscript uh, word processing engine is going to be uh, totally open sourced. Our goal is to transform the relationship between researchers and publishers, to cut across publisher silos, to be non-disruptive, let people use the tools that they're familiar with and that they love, to enable them to publish rich, uh, rich content formats, to accelerate the publishing process, and to promote authoritative publisher content wherever the researcher is working. Here's an example of what the interface might look like. This is obviously not real, it's meant for this presentation, but to show you that there's the opportunity for discovery feeds across the top. If you're in the life sciences, you might want a, a, a meta feed to be alongside your out upon discover feed, the articles that you're authoring in the lower left, and then the collections of content and your reference management are in the upper, upper left. Um, this is an opportunity for the entire community. We felt like we had to put a stake in the ground and jumpstart something, but it doesn't really belong to us. The more broadly it's used, the better value it's going to deliver for us and for all of our partners and for researchers most importantly. Finally, uh, we believe that publishers will serve research better by working together to remove barriers to progress. That might sound pie in the sky or kumbaya. You might put your cynical cap on. The truth is many people in this room have worked very hard to do this before. All of these initiatives led to the success that we've achieved as an industry, and we believe that we can do it again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sorry, I think I might have looked like some evil bouncer then. I didn't mean to. Um, thank you to all three of you. I, I know it's a real task to try and to get over the message in the time we have, um, but we do have a nice uh, little bit of time for some questions to our panel, um, either to individuals or to the whole panel, um, about that practical dealing with where we are and where we're going to go from different stakeholders. So do we have any questions? Have a look, have a look. Do we have one at the back? Okay, thank you. I'll open the bidding at $12,000. Um, <laughs> So it seems one of the themes here, and it's a theme that's been in the industry for a long time, sorry, Kent Anderson Redlink, is that complexity drives costs. And it seems like things, do you see things becoming more complex, less complex? How do we attenuate complexity as you, over the next five years, say? That's great. Uh, whoever wants to answer, take up the microphone. Um, I think it's become more complex. Um, as, as the author of the list of things we do, you know that you, know, you started with a much smaller list than 102, and, um, and it sort of just keeps growing. Um, the technical complexities are definitely increasing, um, and that's why I think we need to look at what it is that we can make easier. Um, where, can we, where are we adding complexity just for the sake of adding complexity and, and where can we sort of pare things down to the basics um, and moving things around. So I, 
it's going to become more complex and it's going to become more expensive because of those complexities, but we may be able to balance that and we're getting more content. I mean, all of the, the number of papers being published just keeps growing and growing. Um, it's something that my team is definitely struggling with in increases in submissions every year. Um, but if we can um, maybe try to offset those complexities by simplifying the things that are easy to simplify, that would be, that would be my answer. Yeah, I couldn't agree more that it's absolutely getting more complex, but certainly we just learned from going through the migration that many of you who've done have probably felt the same, that it's a good opportunity to really reflect on what's important. Uh, what do you really need to, to Judy's comment this morning, serve your customer, serve the end user and the researcher, what do they rely upon, and what perhaps are some bells and whistles that really are not necessary in the process? I would just say from the, uh, from the platform, for platform perspective, the technology is getting better at the same time as complexity is increasing. So we're actually able to do a lot more, um, more efficiently as time goes on. Uh, one great example is the way that we manage user interfaces where we're able to now consolidate um, themes that can be, um, that can support a broad range of publishers in a very economical way, rather than have lots of individual unique designs on every site. And they still look totally different and the best practices for how you let users interact with the site are baked into those themes. So it's actually better at the same time as it's simpler. Evka. Uh, Hi, it's Pierre. Oh, with Pierre. One second, Evka oh, first. Oh. Sorry, you, you saw my finger, but not my, the word. Do you want to go <laughs> afterwards? Let Evka go first. Yeah, oh, thank you. Evke Smit, STM. Um, thank you for the three talks. I find it interesting that in your talks, but also throughout the day now, the, the trend of collaboration across publishers keeps echoing in the room. And uh, that can happen on platforms or on pipelines or on other shared infrastructure. Is maybe now the time ripe for a Spotify for science or something like that. Oh, who wants to take that one on? <laughs> I think that kind of consolidation would be, would strike me as being kind of dangerous. So, you know, I was working in trade publishing in the US at the time that, um, that ebooks uh, became popular and the landscape kind of got carved up among um, Apple, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, each with their own lock-in of customers through their devices and their stores. I would hate to see that happen here, and I would also hate to see something like Spotify sort of, you know, eat, eat the business with a lower price point and, uh, you know, acquire all the value and suck it out of the room from everybody else. Yeah, Pierre Montagno with Code Ocean. What, what struck me about the presentation was, was uh, when we were talking about uh, vendors and, and platforms right now, you're talking about workflow solutions in, in many ways. And I, I see also publishers expanding their role in, in offering um, to, 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 to their constituents, to their authors, as well as, you know, as, as the, you know, they're no longer just publishing right now. They're, they're getting data, they're getting code. The, the, what, what, what's defined as publishing is increasing, and it's working into, into the, the workflow space. Do you see there, there's a tension there? I mean, collaboration is the name of the game, but is there a point when, when there might be some bumping of elbows about what, what your vendors provide and what you as publishers feel like is, is the value you deliver to your, to your end users? There could be, and I think that's why, um, you know, sometimes when we sit in a, in a meeting and we talk about technology, whether it's new technology we want to be offering or new platforms we want to build, um, we'll end the meeting and someone will inevitably say, remember when we used to be publishers? Because it feels like we're not doing that anymore. You know, the sort of, the, that traditional publishing no longer exists and now we're all building technology. Um, I, I think that uh, we need to look at some of the different tools, um, you know, some that, that Jonathan mentioned that Adipon's been working on but will be, I, I think it's interesting that Adipon wants to offer what I guess would be publisher agnostic 
tools. Um, that uh, there, there will be sort of these partnerships and collaborations. But I do think that societies, um, in particular, one of the things that societies have that, that gives us a bit of an advantage is the people. So we have members of our organizations and the communities that have been built. And I think societies have been and need to continue to be very careful to nurture that group and protect them. Um, the researcher may be the North Star of Wiley. They're members for us. Um, and, and, uh, and we have that personal connection with them. And so it will be important for um, society publishers in particular to uh, try to hold on to that, to that audience by giving them what they need. Thank you. Um, going back to Ivka's point, um, before you mentioned Spotify, um, you were talking about you know you've, you, what's come up a lot is this theme of collaboration and standards, and, and we've heard sort of everything from frustration to inspired voices around how to to do this. Um, what do the panel see as I don't know either the catalyst to this, or how to make it happen, or indeed the barrier? What what's there seems to be interest in collaboration. So it, why is it not progressing at the the uh, pace you would like? I mean, I think the biggest thing is fear. Um, you know, fear of the very real risks, you know, some of which we faced, and you just have to, you know, make a calculated decision to either put that aside, that the benefits outweigh it. Um, certainly for a lot of organizations, it's this idea of who we are, this identity crisis, going back to the previous question of are we a publisher, are we a vendor, are we a service provider, who are we? But I think all those questions right now are rather ambiguous because, you know, the very changing nature of the business that, that we're in and the industry. And so, you know, I guess I would just encourage people to look beyond those labels um, and really think of ourselves as groups of individuals that ultimately want the same things uh, to, to, to move uh, scholarly communication forward. And uh, to me, it's a very practical solution of how can we do that? We can't do that alone. We need to do that with others. Um, and so those partnerships are going to look uh, very different from one end to the others, and some of those are going to be vendor commercial relationships, some of those are going to be nonprofit strategic partnerships, but the root of everything, in, in my opinion, is just talking to one another and realizing that there's more, that, more commonalities that we have than, than what divides us. Yeah, I would say, you know, I know Angela said that she sees, to, in, to some extent, Wiley and Elsevier as competitors, and I would say that does make sense, but essentially, the societies and, and commercial publishers are playing more or less the same game. And I feel like the real competitors are somebody like Google or Facebook, who has a totally different value proposition, operates in a totally different scale. I would be suspicious of what Chan Zuckerberg might do or any other you know, organization that seems to be charitable but is founded by a tech entrepreneur who has, been, who has accumulated a tremendous wealth and power. Uh, I would be much more comfortable working with even larger players than, than our, ourselves in our own space. I think the level of trust is really important, and if we don't see each other without the fear and with more trust, we run the risk of being disintermediated by somebody really serious. Thank you. I was going to say, I thought I saw a hand. Fred. Uh, Fred Della, AIP. Question for you, Jonathan. Your workflow tool looks amazing. I wish it existed. So you've, you've, uh, you're going to adapt single sign-on. You're going to clear up my reference management problems. Uh, you're going to make a discovery tool that works. Uh, this half trillion dollar company, Google, hasn't done it yet. Uh, what you didn't mention was who's going to pay for all this? Um, how is this going to be a sustainable R&D project for you? And without divulging uh, sure. competitive information. <laughs> I mean, the authoring tool already exists through acquisition. I mean, there are large volumes of, large numbers of users already of authoring and manuscripts. So that's already an existing business that we're just folding in. Um, the discovery tool, Add Upon Discover, we're not going to charge for end users for the use of it, but we see it as a vehicle for societies and publishers to promote content, promote events. So it's an advertising and marketing vehicle, and we could charge for those capabilities. As far as the authoring tools, we see environments um, in the enterprise where there are people who oft have to author technical documents and need to keep it secure and deliver rich formats within the enterprise. There's a commercial opportunity for us. The, goal, the, the challenge isn't really developing the technology. It's, it's pretty much there. 
The challenge for us is scaling up our marketing operation to be able to go sell it and support the business, which is you know, something that I'm ready to, ready to take on. A lot of the reference, reference management we're hoping is going to be provided by incorporating other tools into the ecosystem. There's Zotero and Mendeley and many solutions. We don't expect to invest in developing everything ourselves. It's why we want to open it up and make it interoperable so that other players can provide tools um, to help make it all work and fulfill the full circle of capabilities around the research that I was representing. <laughs> Thank you. I think people probably want a coffee break now. Um, so unless you've got any burning questions, uh, thanks to our panel. Thank you very much. And um, uh, thank you very much. Thank you.